What is the foundation of all our communion and comfortable dependence on God? Welcome to the Baptist Broadcast. Thank you for tuning in. You can find us anywhere you get your podcast, Podcast Addict, Anchor.fm, iTunes, Spotify, you name it, you can probably find the Baptist Broadcast there. Uh, it's very good to be back with you there. I took a week off. Uh, I was under the weather. You might still be able to tell that in my voice. I still haven't gotten a normal voice back. Not sure what was going on, although I do heavily speculate that it was allergy-related. So anyway, it's just it's just good to be back. Um, I want to look at chapter 2 of the Second London Confession today. And uh, the reason I want to look at chapter 2 of the Second London Confession is pastoral in scope and in nature. And um, the pastoral concern that I have with, or the pastoral concern that I have, which is related to Second London chapter 2, uh, paragraphs 1 through 3, has to do with the ways in which this world changes uh, from season to season, from peace to war, from war to peace, uh, from hardship to prosperity, from prosperity to hardship. And then how that translates into our churches, how there are various changes that churches face from season to season. And being able to kind of reflect on the unchanging God upon which the church and it, it, the purity of its religion is founded is, I think, very valuable for us to do as Christians from time to time. So this is really just going to be a good old episode on the doctrine of God from Second London, chapter 2, uh, articles 1 through 3. Now, if you have a copy of your confession, if you have a copy of the 1689, I would encourage you to open it up to chapter 2 and look with me in article 1 or paragraph 1 of the confession. And what you'll see is a lengthy paragraph that is going to describe what we can know about the one true God through nature. In other words, it's going to describe for us or lay out for us articles of natural knowledge about God. In other words, there's nothing in uh, in Article 1 uh, of Chapter 2 of the Second London Confession that, it, that demands from us uh, a, 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 you know, supernatural revelation, so to speak. These are all truths that, while they are revealed in Scripture— they're also revealed through nature. So for that reason, the truths that are contained in Article 1 of Chapter 2 could be called uh, mixed articles. They're mixed articles uh, because they're not pure articles of the faith. Uh, it doesn't take faith, per se, to believe them. Uh, one can come to a conclusion about these truths apart from saving faith. Uh, that's why it's called natural knowledge of God. It's not something that is is known unto salvation, uh, that which is known unto salvation is revealed through the scriptures alone, and those would be called pure articles of the faith because uh, they are only, they're purely revealed through scripture. They're not revealed through scripture and nature. In the case of Article 1, we're dealing with doctrines uh, related to God or the doctrine of God or that level of the doctrine of God that is revealed to us uh, through nature as well as through scripture. So if you look at if you look at Article One, Chapter Two, it says the Lord our God is but one only, living and true God, whose subsistence is in and of Himself, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but Himself, a most pure Spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, who is immutable. Now keep that word immutable in mind, as well as the language without body parts or passions. Uh, those are two key elements of the doctrine of God here. Who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, every way infinite, most holy, most wise. I've got a spider coming down on my desk. Um, you know... Uh, we now live on four acres, and it's not uncommon to get all sorts of weird creatures, you know, crawling around. And it's just the nature of living out uh, of the city, which I wouldn't have it any other way. Anyway, where were we? Who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, every way infinite, 
most holy, most wise, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will, for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. Okay, and then you have a slew of scripture texts that are cited there. 1 Corinthians 8, 4, 3, 4 and 6, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Jeremiah 10, 10. Deuteronomy 6, 4, of course, is the Shema, the Lord uh, your God is one. It begins, of course, in Article 1 here, the Lord our God is but one only living and true God. And so you have a very basic um, doctrine of God here Um we, we might be able to call it a generic doctrine of God here. Uh, this isn't the, the fullness of God's revelation to us. Of course, we receive the fullness of God's revelation to us in the Holy Scriptures. Uh, but this is a very rudimentary knowledge of God, very basic understanding of, of the doctrine of God. And this is, this is again, this is knowledge that, um, uh, that all, man can, uh, all men can attain to through the light of nature. Um, and so this is this is we could call this uh, natural knowledge of God reveals His holiness, uh, His His divine attributes, and so on. Uh, scripture also reveals it, as you can see through the scripture references that are attached to that paragraph. Um, so you have the you have you have theology proper there in Article One. We'd call it theology proper. You have the attributes of God enumerated there, and then in Article Two. Um, there is more. God having all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself, self-existence, is alone in and unto himself, all sufficient, not standing in, in need of any creature which he hath made. So we're moving now from theology proper to, in paragraph two, dealing with the creature in relation to God. So we start at the outset of article two, God is not in need of the creature. The creature is assumed to be something that is real. Uh, obviously, we are creatures. Uh, God has created the world, um, but here it's it's very upfront in stating that God does not depend upon the creature. He doesn't need the creature, and this should be very comforting for us. Uh, it should be comforting for us in the sense that God doesn't depend in and of himself upon what we are, who we are, uh, what we might do, who we might become. Uh, God is not dependent upon uh, the health of churches. He's not dependent upon the strength of your church or the weakness of your church. He's not dependent upon uh, the powers of this world, uh, whether they be strong or weak or corrupt or incorrupt. Um, he's not. He's not dependent upon any of those things t to be who he is, and this is key to do what he does. So, not standing in in need of any creature which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. He is the alone fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. That's Romans, um, uh, that's going to be Romans 11. And he hath most sovereign dominion over all creatures, to do by them, for them, or upon them, whatsoever he himself pleaseth. In his sight all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature. So as nothing is to him contingent or uncertain, nothing is to him contingent or uncertain. Are there contingent things in creation, creatures that are contingent? Well, of course. Uh, are there things that seem uncertain to us? Yes, of course. But in the mind of God, nothing is uncertain. He is most holy in all his counsels and all his works and in all his commands. To him is due from angels and men whatsoever worship, service, or obedience as creatures they owe unto the creator. And whatever he is pleased further... For, or whatever he is ple further pleased to require of them. Again, a slew of scripture text there. Uh, this paragraph sets us up to understand the relationship of man to God, uh, not only in the fall, but also in redemption. And it also sets us up to understand something key about man's fall and, and sin. That is to say that God is most holy, and he is not the author of sin. And so this, this paragraph here in chapter 2 contextualizes really... Our, should contextualize for us our understanding of the economy when it comes to a consideration of the sin of men or the sinfulness of mankind. Uh, paragraph two here in, in chapter two cuts the knees out from under any wrong assumptions uh, or wrong conclusions that may 
tilt a hat toward uh, God being the author of sin. Uh, paragraph two um, renders that kind of a conclusion or that kind of an assumption invalid if we are to take the confession uh, as a uh, document that is um, logically strung together and hangs together uh, from chapter to chapter. Um, paragraph three, you don't get to the express doctrine of the Trinity until paragraph three. The reason for that, it has to do with uh, that knowledge which is m which is most immediate to the creature, and that would be a natural understanding of God. That's what we know first of God. And then it moves to the subject matter of paragraph three, which is that which is revealed concerning God uh, only in the scriptures. Okay, so so paragraph three, when it begins to discuss in this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences. Now, you're not going to get through nature the reality that there are three subsistences in the one being, all right? Or you're not going to get that there is one God subsisting in three relations, Father, the Word, or Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it says in, in Article 3, or Paragraph 3, in this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences, the Father, the Word, or Son, and Holy Spirit, of one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. Okay, so you have the Father unbegotten. He's neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. He's not created, but he's begotten eternally of the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, all infinite, without beginning, therefore but one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties, the relative properties being the unbegottenness, begottenness, and spiration or procession of the Holy Spirit. Those are the relative properties and personal relations. Which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence upon him? So a couple of things here. When the confession in Article 3 mentions the relative properties and personal relations, it's talking about those relations of origin. Unbegottenness, begottenness, and procession. The unbegotten Father, the begotten Son, and procession of the Holy Spirit from both Father and Son. That it, those are the only, the, the relations of origin are the only distinguishing factors between the persons of the Holy Trinity. There have been efforts, as some of you well know, there have been efforts that arise from time to time which suggest that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinguished by things other than those relative properties. And those things would be, you know, differences in authority. Some would even consider there to be differences in will uh, between the persons of the Godhead. And of course, the most extreme position would be something like tritheism, where they consider the three persons to be three distinct beings that just have a singular purpose, in which case that's polytheistic, it's tritheistic, that would be three different gods which come together to um, engage the same goal. Okay, so we don't want to go there. The only thing that distinguishes Father from Son, Son from Father, Holy Spirit from Father and Son, are the eternal relations of origin, unbegottenness, begottenness, and inspiration. Other than that, there are no distinguishing factors between them. Uh, the way in which, and, and by the way, here's the other thing, the persons are distinct from one another. The persons are not distinct from the essence, if that makes sense. So it, the Father is the divine essence subsisting unbegotten. All right? The Son is the divine essence subsisting begotten. And the Holy Spirit is the divine, the same divine essence with Father and Son subsisting in procession or inspiration from Father and Son. Okay. That last line is what I really want to pay attention to here. Which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our com uh, communion with God and comfortable dependence upon him? So this, pay attention to the language. The doctrine of the Trinity, and, and this is this has to take into consideration the, the two prior paragraphs, paragraph one and two. The doctrine of the Trinity, which needs those two paragraphs in order to be correctly understood, 
is the foundation of all our communion with God. So in other words, a confession of the Trinity and our knowledge and trust in our triune God is really the foundation of our communion with God. All right. The doctrine of the Trinity um, is integral to our redemption. Um, and, and I'm not just... I'm I'm not just alluding here to the covenant of redemption, although I could easily do so, I think. But uh, I'm I'm also talking about the fact that this is the true God revealed to the fullest extent a creature is able to know Him. That comes through the Holy Scriptures, and we are brought to this God through the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, who in the fullness of time took unto Himself our nature, and was in every way like us, excepting only sin. So this Trinity sets up for us an understanding, a proper understanding of Christ, right? We cannot understand Christ without the backdrop of the Trinity. And then the other thing is we cannot understand our redemption or our salvation. We cannot understand the gospel without understanding Christ and, of course, the Trinity that stands in the background of our Christology. So our soteriology stands in front of, right, uh, Christology. Christology stands in front of the background of Trinitarianism, um, theology proper. Um, so theology uh, stands in back of Christology. Christology stands in back of soteriology. It's very under, It's very important that if if we're going to um, enjoy the gospel, uh, and if we're going to understand the gospel, it's very crucial that we understand the person of Christ. But to understand the person of Christ, we need to know something of the Trinity as well, because Christ is the second person of the Holy Trinity, who has taken to himself the fullness of a human nature. Okay. Um, so, this doctrine of the Trinity is a foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence upon him. So, what I really want to say here is that the, you know, you think about the first two paragraphs, especially the first paragraph with all of those attributes, without body parts or passions, God is impassable. Um, and by the way, this is describing Trinity. This is describing the one God, subsistence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what can be said about God? Like what, what is said in chapter one of God must be said of Father, must be said of Son, must be said of Holy Spirit. All right? Equally. Um, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are without body parts or passions. Right? Um, and so... Uh, they are uh, immutable because there's, they're the same essence, right? So they are immutable. They're, they're without change. And so you think about that last clause, which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence upon him. Not only do you have the relations of origin, the missions, the appropriations that uh, are, you know, that terminate on each, uh, that terminate on distinct persons, In which context we understand our redemption. You know, we, we understand uh, redemption according to appropriations. Uh, and that's that could be another uh, conversation. But for example, the incarnation, the work of incarnation accomplished by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the, uh, the incarnation is appropriated to a particular person in the Godhead, and that is the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son. Okay, so that's an important consideration. But then the other part of this is to is to understand the unchangeableness of God and our redemption, to understand the unchangeableness of God and our assurance. So um, how do we know that the promises of Christ hold fast for us today, 2,000 years downstream? And the ground for that is in those divine attributes that are enumerated in uh, paragraph 1, chapter 2. Um, to go further than that, chapter one on the Holy Scriptures, right, or of the Holy Scriptures, must be seen in relation to this last clause of chapter two, article three, which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on him. That has to have some kind of a relationship to the Scriptures back in chapter one, because the Scriptures of course, reveal what we must know 
in order to have that communion with God. Um, but if the Trinity is the foundation, uh, is the foundation of all our communion, communion with God and comfortable dependence upon him, then I think it stands to reason that he is the foundation of the Holy Scriptures. And so that immutability of God, the impassibility of God, should all be understood as a backdrop, even though chapter 1 comes first, this third paragraph in chapter 2 yet reaches back to chapter 1 and before chapter 1, making the Trinity the foundation of all our communion and comfortable dependence upon God. And so the scriptures sit on top of that foundation, meaning that the impassibility and the immutability of God must be held high and must be considered absolutely essential to our communion with God and comfortable dependence upon him. Uh, reason being, if God change, if God changes, if he if he changed from one moment to the next, uh, if he could change in the next five minutes, if he could change in the next two hundred years, uh, the scriptures could be rendered invalid. So, if the promises of scripture hold true for me right now, like they did five minutes ago, like they did two years ago, like they did ten years ago, then it follows. And if and if I have hope, if I have rational or legitimate hope that the promises of Christ in the scriptures will be the same for me two decades, three decades, four decades from now on into glory, then it must follow that those scriptures sit on an immutable and impassable God. This is not a God that can change from being one way or being one emotional state one minute and another way or another emotional state the next minute. The scriptures must sit on top of this immutable, impassable God, unchangeable God. Which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence upon him? So, the other practical import here in this, this very pastoral uh, consideration is this. When things change, when things change in national politics, when things change in your church, when things change in your individual lives and within your families, when a loved one dies, when a loved one uh, apostatizes, when a church goes wayward, or when a church closes its doors, or when a church opens its doors, uh, when a church reforms, uh, when a, uh, uh, a family is stricken with the illness of a child, our communion with God and our comfortable dependence upon him rests not in any of those circumstances. And this means that no matter what about those circumstances change, if we truly understand our communion with God and our comfort and dependence upon him being grounded in the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, then we can better navigate those circumstances when they occur. Uh, and circumstances like them, um, because we're not we're not grounding um, our trust in um, in those circumstances. We're not grounding our trust in a perfect family. We're not grounding our or what we perceive to be a perfect family. We're not grounding our trust in our children. We're not grounding our trust in our spouse. We're not grounding our trust in our churches. We're not grounding our trust in our seminaries. We're not grounding our trust in our friends and family members, we are grounding our trust in the Trinity, who is impassable without body parts or passions, and immutable, doesn't change, such that his promises remain the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So anyway, I just wanted to uh, cover what I thought to be a very pastoral um uh, point from the Second London Confession, chapter 2, those three articles, uh, and there's much more that could be said. Uh, I'm likely going to be preaching on this for the uh, second, uh, our afternoon service uh, this coming Lord's Day. I'm going to preach on the immutability of God, the unchangeableness of God from the scriptures. Um, and, uh, you know, just just for the sake of encouraging the saints to to rest in this wondrous 
beautiful divine being that we call the Trinity. Um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. So, um, hopefully this was uh, helpful for you. If it was, I would invite you to share it. Uh, if not, please at least give a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Again, um, if you're watching this on YouTube, be reminded that you can uh, find us anywhere you uh, listen to other podcasts. So if you're driving, you can't watch a video or whatever, uh, then look for us on Spotify. Look for the broadcast on Spotify or iTunes or, or anywhere else for that matter. If you're listening on iTunes and Spotify, remember that we have uh, uh, a YouTube channel. So check that out. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day.